In competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, understanding the nuance and strategy behind summoning is an art form. At the heart of this lies an open secret on summoning. The normal summon is one of, if not the most important resource in Yu-Gi-Oh. What's going on my boys? YT Dan back at it again with another video. Today we're gonna to be talking about the normal summon. We're gonna talk about how important it is. We're gonna talk about its strength and we're gonna talk about why you are losing because you aren't using it effectively. We're also gonna go through a lot of the history of the normal summon and how we got to where we are today with the one card combo and also the three effect rule. So stick with me today on the Think Phase podcast. You may learn something new or you may just be entertained. All right, my boys, this Think Phase podcast episode is brought to you by Revival of the Duelists, the book that I wrote to help people get back into the game. A lot of what I'm talking about is covered in this book, but also I'm elaborating on a lot of the stuff inside of this book because I do talk about the normal summon. I talk about the three effect rule and I also talk about a lot of other things, but I feel like after all my research, after I got back into the game from playing back in the day as a Yugi Boomer, then relearning the game sort of for Duel Links and then playing Duel Links consecutively for years and then deciding to get back into uh, the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game when Master Duel came out, I had to relearn the game. I had to learn everything from the ground up. And when I learned everything from the ground up, one of the main thing I did, you know, part of kind of like my quote unquote training, you know, you know, I took a lot of notes. I have a lot of just information. I used that information to just put together a book for you guys. It's just, you know, a basic guidebook on how to play the advanced gameplay, not how to play um, out of the rule book. So this will really teach you how to get the ball rolling. But also um, we're going to talk about some of the summon stuff here. So the first thing, you know, as I started out, the normal summon is the most important um, aspect of Yu-Gi-Oh! It's the most important mechanic. You only get one normal summon uh, per turn. And pretty much um, a lot of the monsters that we play and utilize in the game's effects all revolve around, uh, you know, our normal summon. Most of our combo lines all start from the normal summon. And the most powerful decks, you know, have really strong normal summons but there is something i want to cover here as we kind of talk and discuss because this normal summon thing isn't new a lot of people think that this is quote unquote modern Yu-Gi-Oh, but it's not new we need to go back and think about what the normal summon is for our normal summon think of it as a resource like in magic magic the gatherings um resources in terms of like playing a mana unless the rules have changed from the last time i've played you know you do one mana per turn one mana per turn one normal summon per turn so in that way Yu-Gi-Oh's normal summon and Yu-Gi-Oh's um the mechanic of the normal summon once per turn is similar in that way and also um in that same way um over time unchecked normal summons will result in victory just like over time unchecked you know mana placement and a accumulation of monsters and whatever else is gonna come to victory so these are just simple mechanics to help progress the game from um the start to the end because primarily if we're not maintaining or gaining something every single turn then the outcome could never be one or the other in terms of victory you know someone has to be getting an edge and then someone has to overtake so um in Yu-Gi-Oh, we've pretty much mastered this game we've mastered the mechanics we've mastered the normal summon down to the point where the game really will end on the first turn if the opponent that's playing against uh, that first turn player doesn't have a response, you know, or if they're not playing a go second deck, you know, primarily this is because, the, you know, as we know, we studied the hypergeometric distribution and we understand that because one card combos are so strong, if we can play one card to initiate our entire combo, that enables us to play 20 hand traps or maybe more. And if we can play 20 or more hand traps, according to the distribution math, we should open with two to three every game. 
So if we open with two to three every game and a way in to our one card combo, I mean, we should not only be able to go first, but we should be really strong going second as well. And that's what I showed in that Jesse Cotton video um, as I spoke about, you know, his profile and, and how his deck was set up. And it's all set up around Snake Eye Ash. So let's just talk about the normal summon here um, from the beginning. So in the beginning, there was the normal summon. It was for Celtic Guardian. It was for Wing Dragon, Guardian of the Fortress. It was for, um, you know, all these random vanilla monsters that couldn't really do too much of anything. But something, you know, came along from those vanilla monsters. You know, there was a gate for those vanilla monsters, which was level four. And with the level four um, on the gate for the normal summon, that means anything above four is going to be a tribute summon, which we'll talk about later. And then anything uh, below that is just going to be a regular normal summon, which is, you know, kind of where we're at. So when we hit our normal summon, what is the goal of that normal summon? It is to gain field presence. So if you think about back in the day and up to right now, our normal summon back then was to establish board presence, field presence, and advance the game state. Now, our normal summon is to do all of those same things, but instead of just normal summon set for pass, it's normal summon and interaction. So you might not like that someone can play Ash Blossom against your cards but back in the day if i normal summon gene warped werewolf and equipped it with mage power and set three solemn in a magic drain or something it's like you yeah, what are you gonna do <laughs> back then that's just kind of what it was like you know if you if you open like that is just a wrap so in that same way i could open snake eye ash and create an unbeatable board or create a very menacing board where my opponent cannot interact back in the day i could normal summon a monster and create a menacing board in which my opponent could not interact so by opening up these hand traps you know and the normal summons with effects we were able to get to that point of modern interaction in Yu-Gi-Oh. but wait how did i get from normal summons all the way to that you're right. Let me go back. We need to talk about the advanced summon, the tribute summon, because what happened next was um, the tribute summon and you got your cards like summon skull. So I'm being rewarded for keeping a card on the field for one turn. That's the reward. So I normal summon a card. I set back row to protect it or you failed to destroy it. I am now rewarded by it offering being able to offer it as a tribute for a more powerful card to maintain my field presence and to maintain tempo by maintaining tempo i maintain the pace and control of the duel and also keep my opponent on the back foot so there's a clear offensive and defensive position so because of this the tribute summon helps to establish this but later on things got really weird because after you get this tribute summon like summon skull it's really hard to out that how do i out summon skull let alone a blue eyes white dragon equipped with the dragon's bead or or drag equipped with the dragon's treasure with mountain on the field how are you going to beat that well there is a solution we can set cards like man eater bug or use cards like Fissure or Dark Hole to get rid of them. And if we're using those type of cards, this type of one-to-one -one removal, then that creates a bit of an issue for this Tribute Summon. The Tribute Summon doesn't feel worth it if you're baited into using these cards. That way they're kind of like two for ones and it's really bad. So out of nowhere, we start to get these Gemini monsters. Now, these Gemini monsters introduce something new to the game. Rather than being a normal summon and getting the reward or whatnot for your tribute summon, some of these Gemini monsters and our tribute monsters, but some of these G Gemini monsters have an ability to provide a plus one, a plus one from the graveyard or a plus one from the hand to the field. Um, these types of advantages start coming as these effect monsters came around and then you start to see um the turbo decks the uh, gigaplant turbo and all these other decks that allowed you to utilize uh, the gemini effect along with 
the reward of the normal summon and because we're able to advance our plays through this normal summon we learned how effective it is to put a powerful monster on the board through a special summon then burn our normal summon on it and then we could use the effects of like giga plant and ill blood and there's other stuff that i can't really remember at the moment but there's tons of gemini monsters that provided and facilitated these plus ones or minus ones from the opponent so the so the objective has shifted you know, we went from being able to summon a monster and establish board and field presence. I did kind of brush over and blow over how doing that does create a plus one for you and a neg one for your opponent when you attack over their monsters, obviously. But they took away the battle minus one and the battle plus one because some have plus one effects. And they put that directly into an effect monster. They put that directly into a Gemini monster. So now these Gemini monsters have the ability to summon things and go crazy. You see the combo era explode. I believe it's during the synchro era. So, you know, you're going crazy with these synchro plant, crazy um, giga plant, gale blood, zombies going nuts. I mean, it was absolutely insane if you played back then because there wasn't a lot of decks that could do that. And I remember ill blood being very expensive. Um, you know, maybe if I can find a picture or something to reference and I put it up there, but you know, ill blood used to be extremely, extremely expensive. So ill blood was just uh, unobtainable for a lot of people. So, you know, things began to advance and advance and advance. So now, Think about how we've progressed. We started at normal summon, beat sticks. You know, right now, I think the highest beat stick on a normal summon, vanilla guy, is like 2,000, I think. I think. Then we get the tribute summon. Right now, I think the tribute summon on a vanilla normal guy, I believe, is 26. Maybe 27, but I think it's 26. Then you get the Geminis that allows you to get these plus ones. And then these plus ones create this very fast paced Yu-Gi-Oh where sure, we are able to do those things like I told you before about normal summoning and super equipping a monster and making it real troublesome. But in that same way, I could just fissure you, Book of Moon you, Regeki you, or whatever, get you out of the way with my one card, then establish my giga plant whatever combo and now you see the shift where oh well i can't just normal summon and pass anymore or set and pass because these guys are going to go giga plant on me so i've got to go giga plant too so how do you stop all this stuff the giga plants and all these other things you know we don't we don't talk about that right now we talk about that later on in a different uh conversation you'll let me know if you want to talk about that but we'll talk about how things just advanced and counterplay evolved but after we get past the Gemini effects and we're down there, now we're at tribute effects. Now the monarchs are here. Now Treeborn Frog is here. Now infinite resource management and all this other stuff is here. When when all these things came to head at the same time when you had, and I believe monarchs and um, Geminis, you know, definitely like coexisted. But uh, I believe the Geminis are first. I can't 100% remember on the dates, but I believe the Geminis are first. Then the Monarchs came. But the Monarchs came, and it was just supreme advantage. Summon and pop. Summon and banish. Summon and take a card from the hand. Like, absolutely insane. So, so these super powerful cards really rewarded you for a tribute summon. You were really rewarded if your normal summon was able to, like come on the board and do something and don't even speak about normal summoning breaker the magical warrior getting a counter using it to destroy back row attacking over an opponent's monster they set because they can't beat over 16 because they play some sort of uh similar deck for some reason and they set the mystic tomato and pass then you draw the borg do you tribute that breaker for Zaborg, that breaker took two cards from the opponent. Zaborg's going to take a third. That was game time right there back then. But instead of going four turns and, and wasting all that time, nowadays we just normal summon to speed it up. So now let's talk about how 
the power creep came for the monarchs and these tribute guys because all these tribute guys kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger they kept doing crazy stuff you know you got the vanities cards you got all these cards that just do these amazing things when you tribute summon them then you start getting cards that allowed you to just summon them without tributing you know pretty much cards which are cyber dragon effects you know things that were just easily summoned so now these cards are starting to just kind of fall out of favor but then one man shows up one card shows up and changes it all this one card shows up and his name is I mean, come on everybody say it with me class say it with me alistair the invoker now what is so different about alistair and all these other cards well, unlike a lot of other effect monsters at the time, and also all of the tribute mo just like the tribute monsters, Alistair's effect activated when he was normal summoned. So the monsters that are tribute summoned, those are normal summons. But basically, when you are normal summoning Alistair, you can use his effect to get the invocation and do the combo. But what was so insane about Alistair is that not only could he do this combo, he could fuse with the opponent's graveyard. He could cr create untargetable monsters. It was just such a powerful card. So Alistair literally was in everything. Alistair was the first snake eye ash. People cried out injustice when Alistair came out. And you just don't remember those screams because some of you may not have been born or some of you may not have been a duelist. But Alistair the Invoker was the first snake I asked. Check the comment section. There are some survivors for PTSD down there. And there are some warriors of the invocation that will tell you about their dark magics. Look in the comments. I'm, I promise you they're down there. They love to talk about those days. Anyway. I even played with Alistair a little bit when I came back because Alistair is just such a good uh, card to start with. But the difference between Alistair the Invoker and everything he comes with, all of his setup, all of his combo lines, everything that comes with Alistair, the difference between Alistair and the difference between Snake Eye Ash is something I like to call the three effect rule. I think a lot of people say the three effect rule. I think I remember hearing that at least one time somewhere else. I remember at least hearing that at least one time. But the three effect rule kind of pertains to the whole idea of a monster's utility having three uses. Now, sometimes those effects aren't apparent. Like, you know, um, like Alistair, you normal summon Alistair, you go get the invocation, you can use him from the hand as a, uh, as a, uh, 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 attack booster for a fusion and then the invocation that you get helps to recycle him that's three effects all packaged into one card's normal summon if it's not interfered with so if you got a card that can do three things that opens a lot of doors but the third effect is hidden on these new cards which is what makes it annoying for players which is why players hate snake eye ash because it's hard to understand because you don't know what you're looking at and you know and i tell and i definitely understand this and i want to say just make a statement here outside of this you know Yu Gi Oh is not just a regular game it's a game of language it's a game of knowledge and information so you got to understand these things to really grasp what you're doing when you're dueling against the snake eye opponent or against um any opponent that can utilize the three effect rule or any cards that could do that because not every card can do that but the pendulum cards are a great example of something that's obvious three effects the pendulum effect the monster effect and sometimes they got a grave effect it's pretty obvious and then the utility is apparent but snake eye ash is not because snake eye ash unlike alistair the invoker has a little bit of a language difference alistair when this card is normal summon do the thing Snake Eye Ash, when this card is normal summoned or special summoned, do the thing. And it also has its archetypal effect to do the Snake Eye stuff. And then those are just two effects. But the ability to be special summoned in the first place and use your effect at all is an effect. It just can only be used once per turn. What Konami has done is printed a card with three effects that you can only use two of per turn. That's what they did. By allowing you to special summon Snake Eye Ash versus normal summon Snake Eye Ash, you can normal summon Alistair and then play one for one. See what I'm saying? 
that's the difference between something like Snake Eye Ash and Alistair the Invoker. Basically, the ability to be special summoned is a superior means of summoning. The ability to be special summoned and use your normal summon effect is superior to every other monster that says, when I normal summon, do a thing. If you special summon Alistair, you don't get nothing. If I special summon a Tribrigade monster, I don't get nothing unless I activate the effect. But with any of these other cards, they activate on summon, which means my opponent has to respond or not. And if they don't, then I do my thing. So that means your opponent is even, even gets a gun pointed at them where they have to make a choice on if they're responding or not. And then with the whole summoning effect, you also have an opportunity to use turn player priority to chain block. So I could normal summon, Alistair the Invoker, the effect activates, I could chain Forbidden Droplets. You know? Now you can't, you know, activate anything in response to uh, Alistair's search. I know, I knew you had Ash, and I needed to get the search. There you go. You know? Or anything. Anything like that. So, that's where these things begin to change. So, when you get this whole three-effect rule, normal summon versus special summon, what does that look like to you? That's the Giga Plant. Konami went back to the Gemini. That is what's happening here. They learned from Alistair and his popularity, and they remembered the Gemini effects and their brokenness. And they basically turned Alistair up to a thousand and gave him the power of ill blood. They gave him the power of uh, the Giga Plant, and he came out ashy. So now, we're looking at the new advanced thing on Yu-Gi-Oh. So what would the so what's the thing that goes one step higher than this? What's the thing that goes one step beyond this that will make this whole concept or this idea of the normal summon more broken? Normal summons that do all this, that special summon and do all that and can also deliver a minus one and can also deliver a plus one beyond the initial plus that they always do. Because when you summon a monster, they, just, they get it to the field, they put it in your hand, nah, 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 nah. But when you summon a guy and his first, let's say, let's say they come out with Alistair, the snake-eyed invoker. Let's say they come out with that. Alistair, the snake-eyed invoker. Let's imagine that card. When Alistair the Snake Eye Invoker is normal summoned or special summoned, do the thing. Your opponent cannot respond to this effect. That's a power creep up. That's an example power creep up. Same thing, but pop a card. Same thing, but banish a card. Same thing, put it face down. Same thing, put it in the spell trap zone. Same thing, same thing, all same thing. Now, where this gets even more broken, three effect rule, you think about other cards in the extra deck, because that's where it gets crazy on the three effect rule. In the extra deck, where it gets nuts is you get these cards that can summon two monsters. You know, you and what makes it broken is inside of the snake eye deck, they got the flame burst dragon. Flame burst dragon facilitates that same extra deck advantage but it puts it in the main deck and makes it searchable through a one card combo. So that's why a lot of people just say snake guy is doing too much. And I just wanted to point that out on the normal summon. And, you know, before I close on this, I just want to end by telling you guys some things you can do to make sure that you're improving your skills and becoming a better duelist and learning how to use your normal summon. So number one, hide, your normal summon most decks run two to three archetypes nowadays if you're not running two to three archetypes these days you're kind of underpowered you know there's there's so many things about these decks that will limit or restrict you but there is always an archetype that can synergize so you might be a rogue duelist but you shouldn't be turning your nose up at Horus because you hate it because you got tilted on Master Duel one time. Like, Horus is actually a great engine. You should use it if you can afford to discard a card, you know? 
but if you can't afford to discard cards don't be salty because the horse engine is just capable to run inside of another deck and it's tilting you you're not losing to horus you're losing to the efficiency of the snake eye ash that the guy had you're responding to horus you're using ash you know you're using maxi you're doing all that but basically you're burning out of once per turn cards and then getting baited into getting the ash so the only way to counter stuff like that is to play cards like nibiru you know so you're gonna have to play better hand traps and you're gonna have to play better stuff to go second like infinite impermanence and effect veiler so technically if you're going and you're playing and you're going first and you're having a lot of trouble because you get forced to go second add three infinite impermanence add two effect veiler and maybe add one to two Nibiru with your package of Maxi and Ash and whatever else you got. And I guarantee you, you're gonna increase your win rate because you can counter your opponent's normal summon. But on your side, what are you gonna do? How can you protect your normal summon? I like to talk about the best way in talking about protecting the normal summon. Oddly enough, I'm gonna walk away from it a little bit and talk about branded. Cause branded fusion, and the branded deck is a great example of a deck that not only utilizes the normal summon well, but also hides the main card very well. And the main card that they use is branded fusion. And just like any other normal summon that uses the effect to do this or that, they're all weak to Ash Blossom. So a lot of people know that you got to play Ash Blossom on the branded fusion to stop the branded player. But the branded player knows that you know this. So they're not going to just play branded fusion. They're going to summon Alibur and see if you're going to Ash. They're going to activate a card to search their deck to see if you're going to Ash. They're going to draw a card with um, the, Al the, uh, the Albion Dragon to see if you're going to activate Ash. And if you go through all of that and don't activate Ash and they play branded fusion, but sometimes you go through all that find out you don't have branded fusion or they have I mean, you don't have ash or they have that um i think it's called branded lost or whatever that branded uh spell card is that pretty much prevents your opponent from uh doing anything from from responding to the branded fusion so basically they are hiding their spell normal summon because think about it the branded fusion is a spell normal summon for that deck they're hiding their spell normal summon they're hiding their starter they're hiding their key card and they're trying to, everything that they can to bait you into using the one card that they know will kill them so in that same way, you got to have that same attitude about whatever it is your main normal summon is. Your normal summon should accomplish this one thing and one thing only. It should provide you a plus one or provide your opponent a minus one. If it's not providing a plus one or a minus one, then it's kind of not serving you or surviving on the field. You know, staying on the field for one turn is a blessing and also providing a plus one or a minus one. Either way you go. You know, this is what your normal summon should do. But think about it. If the best normal summon is Snake Eye Ash and the low power normal summon is Alistair the Invoker, you need to think about in your deck, where does your normal summon fall in the spectrum? And does it have the same power as Snake Eye Ash? Or has it been power crept like Alistair the Invoker? So I want to thank you guys for checking out this video. I hope that it helped you today. I hope you learned something about the normal summon. And as always, my boys, check out all the rest of the content because your boy is making content every single day for your entertainment and education. So as always, my boys, thank you for listening to the Think Face podcast and keep it dank.